apart from being completely hilarious, this Tom Schwartz Senegashi fight is well worth watching because it gives you an insight into the character of Tom Schwartz and what kind of fighter he is. Now, the fight ends via six round disqualification in Schwartz's favor. Gashi gets disqualified for, I think, headbutting Tom Schwartz. Now, Schwartz himself was constantly committing fouls throughout the fight. And that is what actually provoked Gashi into retaliating with his head. Well, what fouls was he committing? He was constantly leaning down on the back of Senad Gashi's neck, just like you see in this picture. In fact, I'm going to give you uh, an example of some still frames of what I'm talking about. So here we have Tom Schwartz up against the rope. Senad Gashi's launching a big right hand. And Gashi, obviously being a much shorter guy, is aiming to get close and work on the inside, which he managed to do on a couple of occasions without being held. But more often than not, when he would get into a position like this to launch and land big punches, and this big punch does land, it cracks Tom Schwartz on the chin, and this is where it bounces back down to his chest. Once Tom Schwartz gets hit with his punch, look what he does. And he wasn't noticeably hurt by his punch, but it was a good shot. See Tom Schwartz's left arm there? It's round the back of Senad Gashi's neck. And this is something that Schwartz did repeatedly over and over again. Now, in professional boxing, you are not allowed to duck below the waistband. And of course, you see Senad Gashi here is a short guy anyway. He's coming in low to avoid the punches over the top. But he is not ducking below Tom Schwartz's waistband, which is why the actions of the referee in this fight was so absurd. Because he kept on admonishing Senad Gashi for ducking too low. He wasn't ducking too low. His head is clearly above Tom Schwartz's waistband here, but Tom Schwartz, once Gashi gets into a punching position on the inside, he leans his weight on the back of Gashi's neck. Now this does two things. One, it tips Gashi off balance, so Gashi starts falling forward. And it also pushes Gashi down. This is a way of nullifying an opponent's attacks, a shorter opponent. This is something which Klitschko used to do in Germany so much and get away with in Germany so much. And I'm talking about Vladimir Klitschko here, not Vitali. It is completely illegal, as I'll demonstrate to you here. So that's where his, his arm goes. There's a forearm slash elbow. It's right on the back of Senad Gashi's head. Now watch. See there, Gashi's right foot is falling forward because of the, f because of the fact that uh, Schwartz is now pushing down on the back of his neck. So he's, he's falling forward off balance because of the actions of Tom Schwartz. And now Schwartz starts to apply more pressure. Now Schwartz is actually getting on his tiptoes. Now I'm sure there are going to be some idiots in the comment section below saying, Gashi's lifting him up. No, he's not lifting him up. Go watch the fight in real time. I believe this slow motion replay occurs after the third round, okay? Tom Schwartz is deliberately going up on his tiptoes so he can get even more of his weight on the back of Senad Gashi's neck. Yet again, this was another thing Klitschko used to do, Vladimir Klitschko, totally illegal. And now you see Senad Gashi, you know, tipping forward off balance. His, his right glove is actually here on the rope, so he ain't lifting nobody up. Yeah, his, Sorry, his left glove is here on the rope. His right glove is here. He ain't lifting nobody up. He's just trying to stop himself falling forward. Trying to break his fall here. And as you see, leaning on the back of his neck, tiptoeing to get more weight on him. Look at him there. Fully tiptoeing, pushing all his weight down on, on the back of Senegashi's neck. Let's go forward another frame here. And you see Senegashi's head is now going down. And eventually, by the end of this, his head is actually below Tom Schwartz's waistband. And for incidents like this, the referee was warning Senad Gashi for ducking. Look at that. Look at that, people. But <laughs> incidents like this, this idiotic referee, and I don't want to go too far in what I'm saying. I don't want to get sued by this guy. But this referee is admonishing Gashi for ducking too low, and it was clearly, clearly Tom Schwartz committing the foul, pushing this guy's head down to the point where it's below his waistband. 
This is totally illegal. There is no recourse in the boxing rule book, I can assure you, for these kind of tactics. You're not allowed to do this. Tom Schwartz does this repeatedly throughout the fight. Now, the first contentious incident in the fight is when Gashi gets Tom Schwartz into a corner. Tom Schwartz grabs Senad Gashi. Now, Gashi responds by kind of leaping up on his tiptoes to try and break free of the clinch and get his punches off. And in doing so, the top of his head hits Tom Schwartz underneath the chin. And Tom Schwartz has a think about it for a second and then dives onto the canvas and pretends he's out cold. Clearly going for an Oscar. Now, was it an intentional headbutt by Senad Gashi? I'm not sure whether he intended to headbutt him or whether he just was, you know, trying to break free of the clinch by kind of leaping up on his tiptoes and just trying to wriggle his way out. I'm not sure whether it was an intentional headbutt or not. But what I am sure about is Tom Schwartz's reaction was way over the top. And look, I was a bouncer for many years. I've been involved in street fights. I've seen a lot of street fights. I know how devastating headbutts can be. I've seen people knocked out cold with headbutts. But there is no way that the headbutts that Agashi hit Tom Schwartz with, I think it was in the second round, there's no way that that would have knocked Tom Schwartz out cold. And you can see in the slow motion, in fact, let me get it up here. See here, this is the, uh, the fight itself, the moment where he's just been hit, hit by the headbutt. And you can see, if you watch this in slow motion, it's at the nine minute mark of this video, you can see Tom Schwartz get hit with a headbutt and then go, ah, oh, he hit me. And then split second decision, he decides to drop to the canvas and pretend that he's out cold. Clearly acting. That's not good to see. <laughs> it's not good to see at all because it suggests that this guy in a crisis situation may quit. That's what it suggests because there is no way that early in a fight, Tom Schwartz would be, I mean, he, look, he wasn't, it's, it's not up for debate. He wasn't hurt by that headbutt. That headbutt did not cause him to legitimately be knocked out. But look at Tom Schwartz's reaction. Look what he does. Look at him there. This is him on the canvas pretending that he's out cold. <laughs> People, stop it. This guy's got this guy's got jokes. Huh? So this is an insight into the kind of character Tom Schwartz is. Senad Gashi was giving Tom Schwartz plenty of trouble, by the way. And that's why Tom Schwartz resorted to the constant holding, the leaning on, the pushing down. And the referee allowed him to do it. Yeah, he told Tom Schwartz on several occasions, don't lean down. But he was also at the same time selling, telling Senad Gashi, don't duck down too low. He wasn't ducking down too low. In the boxing rules, as long as you're not ducking below the waistband of your opponent, then that is fine. Senad Gashi was not ducking below the waistband. Tom Schwartz was pushing his head down once... Gashi got up close into a punching position. Tom Schwartz being a taller guy, forearm on the back of the neck, pushing him down. Gashi off balance, leaning forward. Then Tom Schwartz up on his tiptoes, pushing him down even more. And then his head eventually ends up below his waistband. That's what was going on. It was clear to see for everybody. The ref knew what was going on. But Tom Schwartz being, I guess, the home favorite was allowed to get away with that kind of thing. And Tom Schwartz obviously inspired by Vladimir Klitschko to be using them kind of tactics. Terrible, terrible stuff. And the worst, most, you know, horrific use of those illegal tactics I've ever seen in my life was Klitschko against Povetkin. That was so disgraceful. I still have nightmares about it today. <laughs> but yeah, so Schwartz may be lacking in the spirit department, in the heart department, if he's willing to pull theatrics like this. It very much reminds me of somebody like an Andre Durrell, you know, pulling theatrical tactics like this. Uh, it reminds me also of Dimitrenko when he fought Joseph Parker. Similar theatrics. Okay, I know what a fighter looks like when he's been legitimately hurt by a body shot or a headshot or even a headbutt. And trust me, 
Tom Schwartz was fine here. You guys, you guys go watch it in slow mo for yourselves, and you'll see what I'm saying. So not really, you know, the best uh, endorsement here, is it? This fight for Tom Schwartz, the way he performed was poor. He won by disqualification because his fouls were not being, you know, he was not having points deducted for his fouls, whereas Gashi was having points deducted for his retaliation fouls. And they were retaliation fouls for the most part. Yeah, he was frustrated. And, and trust me, people, if I can go back to the stills again, you get some people, particularly during the Vladimir Klitschko era, who would make excuses for these kind of fouls. And they would say, well, you see, it's the opponent's fault for getting too close. He needs to know. No, no, no. He doesn't need to know how to do anything. It's illegal. What kind of nonsense is that? You could say the same for the headbutt. Well, oh, the opponent only headbutted you because you allowed him to get too close. If you don't want to get headbutted, don't get that close. <sighs> People, it's illegal. Simple. There is no, oh, he shouldn't do this or he shouldn't allow it. It, it, it. What is illegal is illegal. It's not, the onus is not on the opponent to avoid putting himself in a position where the other guy is going to foul him. That's not who the onus is on. The onus is on the referee to make sure that the fighters are not fouling each other and he does so in a fair way. Not showing favoritism where one guy's allowed to lean all over the other guy and get no points deducted. And the little guy's just supposed to take it. Because trust me, people, for any of you who haven't boxed, <laughs> right? When you're in there with someone who's way bigger than you and they weigh whatever Tom Schwartz weighs, 240 pounds, and Senegashi is only about six feet tall. And this 240 pound man is leaning on you the way that Tom Schwartz is here leaning on Gashi, trust me, that is going to wear you out real quick. You get real tired real quick with a big guy like that is leaning on the back of your neck constantly. Every time you get close, forearm goes on the back of your neck before you can even get your shots off. This was after uh, Gashi had landed one big right hand and Schwartz is doing this. People, that's illegal. You see, this is why I wonder how well Mike Tyson would have actually done in this era, even in the Klitschko era, because even though Tyson was a dynamic puncher and he was fast and explosive, he never had an opponent lean on him other than maybe Lennox Lewis when they eventually fought, but even Lewis got, I believe he definitely got a warning early on in the fight for leaning on like this and also a point deduction, rightly so. But Nobody else, from what I can remember, when Mike Tyson was fighting, was leaning on him like this. They were clinching, sure, like Bone Crusher Smith was clinching, but nobody was leaning on like this. And it's this kind of leaning on that wears you out real quick. And so Mike Tyson today, or even during the Klitschko era, if he had a 250-pound man leaning on him like that for three, four rounds, he's going to get real tired real quick too. And after three, four rounds, he ain't going to have them explosive punches no more. So I do wonder about Tyson in this era of leaners, you know, Klitschko particularly. Lewis used to do it as well. Let's not get it twisted. But Lewis didn't get away with it so much in the big fights. Rightly so, the referees were a lot more strict on uh, Lennox Lewis because he was fighting American fighters most of the time in the big fights. So they, they didn't allow any funny business with the leaning and, and all this kind of business. But with Vladimir Klitschko fighting in Germany, he was doing this to the extreme and being allowed to get away with it for the most part. Terrible, terrible stuff. Tom Schwartz has taken inspiration from that and that's what he does to Senad Gashi in this fight. So, we have here in Tom Schwartz a guy who will result to illegal tactics, as many fighters do, okay, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a poor fighter because you resort to illegal tactics. Mike Tyson himself used to resort to illegal tactics, right? We know that, and many other fighters have. But we know we've got a guy who will resort to bending the rules and you know doing some naughty things when he's got a spirited opponent in front of him who's trying to do damage. And we also know that when he's in a bit of a jam, he may pull theatrics. He certainly did in the Senad Gashi fight. When that little tap underneath his chin that some people are calling a headbutt, you know, hit him, 
He went, ah, and then flung himself on the floor. That's not how people go down when they're genuinely hurt from a punch or a headbutt. They don't fling their arm up in the air like, ah, oh, he headbutted me and then fall on the floor. That's not what they do. They don't make any noise. They just go down. <laughs> they don't make any, any crazy gestures. Oh, he, he hit me. And then no, that's not what they do. They just go down. <laughs> Sometimes there's a delayed reaction, but it's a delayed reaction where they're kind of floating in, in, in midair. They're stunned. They don't fling their arms up in the air and ah, as if they want to start complaining and then go on the floor. That's not what they do. They might stand there for a second. You know, like David Price, when he got knocked out by Povetkin, he got hit with one shot and he was kind of just floating in midair. The delayed reaction. Then Povetkin came in with a left hook and dropped him. You know, the, the, the punch that finished the fight. So anyway, <laughs> you guys have a look at this Tom schwartz Senegashi fight. I think it's very insightful. I think it shows us that Tom Schwartz isn't a particularly spirited fighter. That's what I think it shows us. Maybe he'll ri rise to the occasion against Tyson Fury. I don't know. But from what I'm seeing here, and you know, I did look at the Tom Schwartz fight prior to making the Tyson Fury, uh, Tom Schwartz video, but I didn't watch it in its entirety. I just kind of skimmed through it. But now I've watched it in its entirety. As I say, it's a pretty entertaining fight just for the theatrics, just for the WWE feel of it. Um, but now that I've watched it, yeah, Tom Schwartz isn't looking like a great opponent, truth be told, because of his character. If Tom Schwartz had the same kind of fire in him that a Senad Gashi had, I'd actually be a little more hopeful. Senad Gashi, again, terrible technique. You know, he's not going to win any uh, technique competitions in boxing, but when it comes to fighting spirit, he has it. Tom Schwartz doesn't seem to have that much of it, you know, <laughs> from what I'm seeing here. He seems to be someone who, if he can get you disqualified, he'll get you disqualified, right? I mean, you remember when Victor Ortiz headbutted Floyd Mayweather, and that was a blatant headbutt, right? Some people are going to say, Gashi did the same. No, 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 no. Gashi was not as blatant as what uh, Victor Ortiz did. Because from what I remember, Victor Ortiz wasn't even being clinched at a time when he headbutted Mayweather. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he was being clinched. But he just, you know, like a billy goat, rammed his head up into Mayweather's face. Mayweather didn't pull no theatrics. Mayweather didn't jump on the floor. Ah! <laughs> he didn't see none of that. And it was a far more damaging headbutt. In fact, Vladimir Klitschko, when he headbutted Tyson Fury, it was a far more severe headbutt than what Tom Schwartz got hit with. Tyson Fury didn't jump on the floor, start rolling around and pretending he, he was out cold. And that was a far more severe headbutt than what Tom Schwartz got hit with. And I know not everybody has the same punch resistance, but trust me, people, when you've seen enough street fights, when you've seen enough genuine headbutts, there's no way. There is no way that Tom Schwartz was genuinely hurt from that headbutt. That was theatrics. That's what that was. <laughs> now, the fight did happen a while ago. It was back in 2018. Uh, Tom Schwartz has fought a few times since then against nondescript opposition, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> has he gained any spirit since then? Has he learned from that? Was there any backlash in the German press for his theatrical performance? I don't know. So you guys tell me what you think in the comment section below. Based on what I've seen of Tom Schwartz, you know, and he's not actually that big a guy. He's six, five and a half. He only weighs in the low 240s, mid 230s. So he's not that big a guy. He's big. Don't get it twisted. But compared to a Tyson Fury, he's not that big. Compared to an Anthony Joshua, he's not that big in terms of body mass. Obviously bigger than Wilder um, in terms of body mass, but yeah. Uh, so not, not an enormous guy in terms of body weight. Certainly a lot bigger than Gashi. I think Gashi was 220 for the fight, was he? Yeah, 221. So certainly bigger than Senna Gashi. But not an enormous heavyweight. Skills, very basic. It doesn't seem to be anything there in his... Uh, his toolkit, which would bother Tyson Fury from what I've seen in a couple fights I've watched of his now. So it should be fairly plain sailing for Tyson Fury. So we'll see how it goes down. I'm going to do another video actually about Tyson Fury with regards to how well he's going to go down in America because we know that he went down well during the, the build up to the Wilder fight and obviously the fight itself in the aftermath. He was received well in the United States. 
But going forward, if he's going to be fighting the Tom Schwartzes of the world and people like that, how are the American public going to react to Fury? Are they going to buy into this kind of stuff? Are they going to like him? Is this going to help build his profile? Or is it actually going to turn them off? Because Tyson Fury is generally a safety first kind of fighter these days. Back in the days, Tyson Fury used to get involved, right? But from, let's say, let me think. When was the time when, maybe after the, after the Steve Cunningham fight was when Tyson Fury started tightening up? Naturally, no, no, it was, it was way after that. Because uh, the Steve Cunningham fight, after that, that's when the David Hay fights were supposed to happen. They fell through, and then he put on a load of weight and came back against that southpaw whose name escapes me, the American southpaw. And he was a bit reckless in that fight. Then he fought the Chisora rematch and also Hammer, right? In those fights, from, from then on, Tyson Fury has been safety first. He hasn't been a guy who likes to get involved. And so if he's fighting that way against the Tom Schwartz, how's that going to go down with the... American public. I'll cover that in a separate video. But for now, let me know what you guys felt or what you guys feel about what I've said in this video with regards to Tom Schwartz, his character, the type of fighter he is. You know, as I say, style-wise, skill-wise, very basic. Um, you know, here's what it is. Let me know how you feel, people. It's happening. I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week covering a wide variety of controversial topics as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.